Welcome everybody to the very first episode of Up the Ladder with Nate Stein. I'm Nate Stein on behalf of SPKN and I am joined today by a good friend of mine and a fantastic writer, podcaster, editor, you name it in the sports media world, Grayson Weir, associate editor and social media coordinator for BroBible.com, a podcast host for the On3 Sports Network, and a senior editor for HighlyClutch.com. Grayson, thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Glad to be here. It's you know good to talk about the sports media network and let people know what's out there. Yeah, yeah. You've uh, obviously done a lot of different roles working in sports media, but I want to take it back all the way to the beginning. When did you know that you wanted to do something like this, whether it was sports media specifically or writing or podcasting? Day one. Um, so sports has always been a part of my life. My parents grew up um, USC Trojans fans, so mm. when I was six, seven years old, um, USC was winning national championships in football left and right. Yeah. Grew up in Connecticut, so I was a New England Patriots fan. The Patriots were winning the Super Bowl. Um, you combine those things together with the fact that my third grade football team won a championship, and I thought sports were the coolest thing ever because I could not lose. Right, yeah, rain culture. <laughs> I mean, you're winning left and right. Exactly. So I knew from the beginning that sports was always my thing, specifically football. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as I got into school and started to figure out where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do, words always came naturally to me. Mm. So when you're able to put those onto a page and you know writing and combine that with the sports world, it was a pretty easy no-brainer for me yeah. to get into a place where I can just talk all things sports and use uh, my vocabulary and, and my platform to speak on topics and sports and things that excite me. Awesome. So what did you study in school? I was a journalism major, but I had a uh, marketing minor and an anthropology minor as well. Oh, wow. How's a anthropology? So, how, how does that fit in? What, what kind of drew you to that so being I so focused on sports? Kind of stumbled into it. It was one of those things where I took a couple anthropology classes on mm -hmm. a small level. Um, and then eventually, you know, my advisor was like, hey, you could get a minor in it if you keep pursuing it. But what I like about the anthropology degree is you're studying people. So when people mm -hmm. think anthropology, they think... Um, archaeology and like yeah. Ross from Friends. Yeah, absolutely. It's not the case. Okay. Um, it's just the study of people and culture in general. So taking that kind of anthropological mindset into the journalism field is a unique way to look at um, different areas and interviews and people and topics from a, a perspective that people wouldn't necessarily think of a journalist where it's typically kind of X, Y, and Z, you know, report the facts. Mm -hmm. Taking that anthropological background, you can put who is the person behind the story. Oh, interesting. So did you do any external programs or any post-grad, anything like that to prepare you further? Or did you feel like your journalism degree and then obviously the anthropology side really set you up for success right off the bat? I think with a journalism field in particular and sports media and writing, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say external programs, but internships are key. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I had done an internship every summer since my freshman year of college, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, where I did social media, I did politics, I did all these different things, and ultimately kind of used those opportunities to narrow down, okay, I want to be in sports, and I want to be on the print side of the business rather than the broadcast side of things. Interesting. So what was your first role? And was there something that somebody, maybe an advisor or superior told you a piece of advice that you felt like really left a mark on you and kind of set you on the right path? Definitely. So I, my first real role, true job, if mm -hmm. you will, rather than an internship, yeah. I was the senior editor um, for our school paper in college at Ole Miss. And my academic advisor told me very early on where there's smoke, there's fire. So wherever, I mean, obviously that common expression can be used across all fields and all different platforms and even just everyday life. But in journalism, where there's smoke, there's fire means if you something seems off mm -hmm. or if something seems interesting or unique, but there isn't a lot to it, follow that and then there might be a bigger story to come from it. Interesting. What was the first story that you either broke or that you really remember writing in? Like kind of, not necessarily blowing up, but kind of getting into the public eye. Um, Hugh Freeze in oh. 2014 was the head coach of the University of Mississippi. He got in trouble for a lot of different things. Um, but in particular, he had some NCAA violations for recruiting. Mm. Um, I was kind of on the fronting edge, cutting edge as 
the sports editor of the Ole Miss school paper of a story in which Hugh Freeze, we were able to kind of get into his phone records and some interesting things in there. So it was kind of one of those things where there's smoke, there's fire. It was, okay, he's left this paper trail. How do we go get it? How do we take from that paper trail and really make it into something bigger? That's crazy. I mean, that's huge news. So obviously being up close and personal at the Ole Miss paper, that's massive to be able to find that type of story. Obviously timing's a little bit helpful because it doesn't doesn't happen to everybody. It doesn't happen to every coach, although there's some whispers that it might happen with most coaches, but NIL obviously changing that now. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the most interesting part of your job that someone who's looking from the outside in at sport journalism might not know or might not expect? I, I talk to people about this all the time. They ask me, you know, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And it's a really hard thing to explain because yeah. people don't understand that in your day-to-day life, you're scrolling the internet, you're scrolling Twitter, you're scrolling Facebook, you're scrolling, you know, brobible.com, on three, highly clutch, all that stuff. Nice plugs. And <laughs> you are a using it as entertainment. Mm. For you, that's something you're consuming. And it's hard to kind of see beyond that veil of the back end side of things. So where where we come in is is your most people's day to day entertainment is actually our job. So mm-hmm. we are the ones providing that entertainment from the back end where people don't see what goes into it. You know, you see 300, 500 words on a page and you think that it took them four seconds. Yeah. Not necessarily the case. Sure. Sometimes the words come. Sometimes you're sitting there. Oh my gosh, what is the sentence I need to you know say next? How does this lead to the next point that I'm trying to make and all that stuff? So there's a lot more to it that people don't see on the back end of side of things. Where hmm. as a consumer, it comes easy. As the person creating that content, it's not always the case. Interesting. So every day, are you pretty much? just writing, do you have it split up where maybe on a Monday you're writing, a Tuesday you're recording, Wednesday you're looking at somebody else's article and you're editing and making sure that it's ready to go up? What does an average day look like? Walk me through that a little so bit. So that's what's cool and something I actually really appreciate about the position and, and jobs that I've been in, particularly at the moment. Um, you never really know what day to day looks like. Hmm. I wake up every morning and as someone who I don't like, I like the status quo, but I don't like you know, get in, clock in, punch out. This is what you have to do. Boom, 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 boom. Your day is done once that's done. I like something where I wake up every morning and I have no idea what I'm gonna be doing for nice. this. To where it could be aggregating content from other sources. It could be following a lead that I had from you know a press release. It could be writing out 3,500 words you know, on a really in-depth piece. It could be writing 250 words on a silly moment in the baseball game. Huh. And then on top of that, you know, the podcasting we do twice, three times a week. Um, and you have to follow the stories. On slow sure. days, you can't just make things up yeah. because then you're making things up. Yeah, that's you know? fair. So you have to follow the content. And on slow days, you have to let those slow days be slow days. So I, there isn't really a day to day to yeah. answer your question, which is great. Um, but the vast majority of my time is spent you know, putting words on a page. Yeah, so let's get a little bit more specific, if, if you can, with what you're working on right now. We're obviously in the midst of Eastern Western Conference Finals for the NBA, NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, baseball season's getting into swing, or we're looking at a lot of college baseball teams getting ready to go on to the regionals or super regionals or conference tournaments. What, what's your day today? What, what were you working on before we started doing the show? So my niche, where I found a lot of my space is within college football. Mm-hmm. And in the world of college football today, in years past where the season would kind of be that August to January at the end of mm-hmm. the bowl games and then you'd have a minute there in February with recruiting sure. in today's day and era it's year round so wow. college football is all day every day with the transfer portal name image and likeness yeah. with something like yesterday uh, Texas Tech quarterback Tyler Shaw, um signed an NIL deal with a jeweler oh wow and used that deal to propose to his girlfriend so that's amazing finding unique interesting stories on the kind of opposite side of college football is where i'm yeah. spending a lot of my time these days but obviously as like you said college baseball is under swing um we got eastern concert finals western conference finals things of all that nature you are constantly looking for the stories behind the stories because with a site like bro bible with a site like highly clutch even potentially with a site like on three 
big media sites, legacy media, if you will, like ESPN, Fox, mm-hmm. they're going to win 10 times out of 10 with the straight news. Yeah. Because that's where the vast majority of consumers go. Sure. So where I come in and where our job is different from, say, an ESPN reporter is taking that news, whatever that headline may be, and finding a spin that makes it different. Hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about your research, your fact finding as you get ready for the podcast. A big part of what we're trying to do at SPKN is make sure that the right, the good information gets into the right hands so that we can make sport better. That right. If you want to put our mission or vision into just one phrase, it's let's make sports better than they are. How do you go about finding research and making sure that you're getting the right information, source checking, fact checking, making sure that you're not spreading something that could be either hurtful or just straight up wrong? It's a very thin line because Mm -hmm. in some instances, particularly with um, the current age of name image and likeness and and all the kind of wild west to it, there is a lot of contradiction. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of he said, she said. And so you have to go off of ultimately having the paper trail to back up what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So I can say something, but if I don't have, you know, something to back that up whether I share it in the article or not I could potentially have someone come out and contradict that sure whereas if I just make it up you know I'm just making it up Mm -hmm. so it's very difficult in that you have to always find every finite detail Mm -hmm. or else that door is open for someone to say that's not true so you have to cover all your bases and you have to um, go further beyond just like I said that that initial headline is great yeah but you have to have the body and the text and the evidence to back that up interesting all right let, let's just have a little bit of fun here while you've been working have you found yourself in a situation or writing about <laughs> something where you just had to stop and look around and go Man, if this wasn't going out onto the internet, if this wasn't going out for the world to see, nobody would ever believe this situation that I'm in. Yes, I think most recently, um, there has been a lot of conversation around name, image, and likeness in College Mm -hmm. Station with Texas Uh, A&M's number one recruiting class. Mm -hmm. Um, I have had a few different instances over the course of the past three, four, five months in which I've been on the cutting edge of a story out of College Station and a specific head coach of Texas A&M has cited our site in a negative sense because of course he is. Yeah, he's trying to cover his bases. He's trying to make it look like he's doing everything by the book and that NIL, to his point, isn't the only thing getting him that number one recruiting class. Right, and that might be the case, but... Those last three months have been pretty crazy when I really sit back and think, oh my goodness, Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban are yelling at each other about name, image, and likeness, and I'm somewhere in the middle. Whether they know it or not, I do. Yeah. And like you said, if it hadn't gone out on the internet, nobody would know. Right. And even still, people don't necessarily know that I'm the cause of this firestorm. Yeah. And it's pretty crazy when you really sit back and think, oh wow this conversation is being had because of something that I posted on the internet. That's wild. I mean, yeah, it's, it's been dominating headlines around college football to your earlier point, year-round sport. It really and, is. And there you are at the eye of the storm. And a totally normal one at that. Totally, <laughs> yeah, normal totally, totally normal. Totally <laughs> normal. All right, so before we finish up, one thing that we like to do at SPKN with all of our guests is we like to hear a coach story. It can be positive or negative, but some sort of experience that you had either from your childhood or even from adult dealing with coaches that impacted you one way or another. Definitely. So Andy Kennedy was the head basketball coach at the University of Mississippi from for like 10 years. Hmm. Um, He stepped down, resigned. It was kind of a mutual parting of ways, whatever, fired, whatever you want to say in 2014, which was my senior year. I was the sports editor at the school paper and Andy Kennedy's career came with I wouldn't use the word controversy, but there were some moments that were questionable. Yeah. Um, whether it be on the court or off the court, there was a lot of decision making and things that stuck out in his career. So I wrote something of a breakup letter, oh. you know, as you would write to your girlfriend or significant other, boyfriend, whatever. Um, 
basically saying, I love you, but it's time to move on. You know, this okay. relationship has run its course. Um, and I pointed out the good times and the bad times and just said, hey, thank you for everything. Thank you for all that you've taught us. You know, we're excited for the next chapter. And so I hit, it went out on the back page of our school paper on a Friday, full page, you know, big, basically the breakup letter to Andy Kennedy. So yeah. thank you, but also we're ready to move on. Yeah. A couple hours later, I got a text, hey, Gray, dot, 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 it's AK, Andy Kennedy. Thank you for the kind words, like so much love for what you guys do at the Daily Mississippian. Um, it was pretty neat. So it yeah. was not something I expected. And to this day, I don't know how he got my phone number. You, so you didn't have a relationship with Coach Kennedy before you wrote that? I did from press conferences. Sure, but he, not like a personal one-on-one. -on -one. You hadn't spent never, time together, just you two talking and getting to know each other. Right. And and I mean, I had in passing and, and mm -hmm. around his players. And we had spoken and he knew who I was. Sure. But we had never texted. Wow. We had never called. And then all of a sudden, I got a text from him. Um, out of the blue, it was pretty neat. And it, to answer your question, probably the most prominent coaching story uh, that sticks out to me so far in my life. Yeah, I mean, that's cool. It says a lot about Coach Kennedy that you obviously mentioned that you went over the good times and the bad times, that he wanted to focus on the good and say, hey, I, I appreciate the kind words. Like, I, I get where you're coming from. This is cool. Like, let's get ready for this next chapter. That's awesome. Yeah, no, he's killing it at UAB. Shout out to Coach wow. AK. There you go. Well, that's a great spot to end on. Grayson, I can't thank you enough for being on Up the Ladder. Thanks for joining us on SPKN. Absolute pleasure. Anytime.